I'm going to just tell you a few quick stories. Um, I can't remember when I was here, maybe 12 years ago. Uh, I sort of was born at the other end of Africa, uh, in Tunisia, and I lived my first four years in, in Morocco and Egypt until I was ripped from the continent um, and taken to the UK. You can see how depressed I look almost <laughs> immediately. And, and um, you can see also the... Uh, the beginnings of my design career. So I, um, I wasn't very good at school, but I was, and the school wasn't very good to me either, but they had a great ceramics department. And I think if I try and post-rationalize my, um, my career, and people always ask where the inspiration was, I wasn't conscious of it at the time, but there's something about transforming um, disgusting, wet, shapeless mud into something desirable, hard, and shaped, which probably did have quite a big influence on me. So that was the only thing I excelled in at school, was pottery. But I soon forgot it for music. And, um, and again, in a, in a sort of post-rationalization, people always think oh, that music might have had a big influence on me. And I, I don't suppose it did particularly from a, a musical perspective, but what's quite interesting about being in a band is that you make your own stuff and you sell it yourself, and you promote it yourself. So everybody was in a band at the time. Everybody's the DJ now, but at the time you all had a, a band. And <laughs> you would learn your own instrument, you would make your own tunes, you would go on stage and play them, and you would sign a record deal, and then you would sell your music. And I think that's probably taught me how to do what I do today. So. I was very fortunate to grow up in, in a miserable time in, in, in London um, in terms of economics and manufacturing and jobs, but from a creativity point of view, it was kind of extraordinary, um, very anti-establishment. And again, it was a sort of landscape that allowed people just to do what they, they thought they could um, by themselves with no real support. In, um, when I was still at high school, in about 76, Sex Pistols were number one in the, in the hit parade and they had been banned on radio. They didn't have a record deal, but they still made it number one. They couldn't play their instruments either. And, um, and the sound was pretty rough, but they were still number one. And I think that, that as a psychological environment was quite useful. Um, so I, I, I gave up um, uh, music mainly because of motorbikes. I did first break my leg, um, which stopped my... Uh, six months at art school, and then I broke an arm, which stopped my music career. And um, I was replaced by a much better bass player, who's now uh, the replacement bass player in Pink Floyd. So my destiny could have been Pink Floyd, basically. <laughs> so I've, I've, um, I also collected vintage cars and bikes, and I'm not that old, right? But what I did during this was I, I learned how to weld. And, and welding became... Um, very quickly, a kind of superpower. I evolved from being a musician to working in clubs, and it left a lot of time during the day to um, actually enjoy myself. And what I enjoyed doing was making things. So I made things from the rubbish of the streets of London. And this picture is actually a pre-welding photograph. You can see here that it's actually not got any new material. It's not got any skill. It's a very uncomfortable chair. It's quite dangerous, actually, as a chair, and it's also quite rusty. But it's completely free, and free of any knowledge or skill, but just made by twisting bits of wire um, around a frame. Now, the important thing about it isn't whether it's comfortable or functional, the rest of it, but it was more that it had a, a personal attitude. And I think, again, all too often people forget that one of the most important things, you know, if you want to make it anywhere as a designer, is to, is to be yourself. And nobody else was making stuff like this. Um, at the time in London, so it was very much my own, despite being rough and ready. So this is my first attempt at an office chair, and you can see it's got a swivel, and um, it's, it's already looking a bit um, more comfortable. It's very heavy. Um, this is, a, 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 as my welding gets better, it improves. In fact, um, Heatherwick, who was talking yesterday, told me that his first job, age 19, was welding... Um, welding these bits together. So age 19, when he was still at college, he came and got a job in my studio and welded these for me. So these are uh, uh, ladles from a Chinese cooking shop. These are uh, pieces of a bicycle uh, front fork. 
Um, and uh, these are the ladle handles in the back. And that was Heather Witt's job. So I did pay him, right? Um, and he worked all summer. And we did joke yesterday that maybe he'd give me a paid internship in his studio now, because he's doing OK. So I've always thought of, al of design really as alchemy. And I think um, that's what I, I saw very quickly from um, my first experiments, is that even though they were peculiar and, and non-conventional, um, I was able to turn rubbish into gold, kind of literally, because um, I was able to sell these things, not for a lot of money, um, for very little money, 15 pounds, 25 pounds. And I had a tiny studio, which was pretty much the size of this desk. So if I didn't sell the things, I couldn't make another one. So practice became the thing, and money became the thing. I thought that, wouldn't it, isn't it amazing that you can just have an idea and turn that idea from a piece of scrap into a piece of gold in the same day. And again, from a, from a profession perspective, I think that's what all of you who are designers are doing every day. You're turning something into something better and probably making a living from it. So you can see the, the chairs became slightly more conventional, possibly more comfortable, a bit cleaner. And again, it was just practice. This one is just... Um, in function of buying a new tool in, in the studio, and that was a guillotine which shears metal into flat strips. And so you'll see a lot in the following few slides the influence of the material or the, or the manufacturing process on, on the object, which was really leading the design. So for a long while, um, after my rusty period, uh, it was a, a flat sliced sheet period, which looked a lot like that. Um, then came a, a kind of more structural engineering period, and you can see my welding becomes much, much more refined now. And this is an attempt at the lightest chair in the world. Probably a failed attempt, actually, but it still um, shows uh, the idea of, a, of an object made um, from trial and error and learning about triangulation and really seeing the object collapse under fat people and then making it again um, with stronger pieces in. So it's, it's learning, and, and the shape is really defined by by a series of failures and a, a series of, of tests. So I became a designer through practice. And again, I think all too often, particularly when I visit art schools, you know, people are constrained to make one or two projects um, uh, for their finals and, and are encouraged to spend a lot of time and energy on, on a single idea. And what was great for me was not having those constraints and just making more and more stuff faster and faster and, and teaching myself the, 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 by trial and error, if you like. So, um, again, slightly more elegant chair here. And this, this is one which, which kind of um, took me away from, from England, which at the time, like I said, was, was pretty miserable from a, a cultural perspective. We used to look to Paris a lot for, for culture or, or New York for, um, for um, musical culture and fashion culture as well. And, and there was no industry, no jobs, really, for people doing design in the UK. It was, it was in, in, in pretty much collapse. And this, this is a chair which kind of sums it up a bit more. It's still got some found objects in it. Um, this is the, um, the steering wheel from a Golf GTI. Um, and this is the rubber from the inner tube of that car. And it's a very comfortable chair, but it's, a, it, it, it's um, very rubbery and, and it does smell rather a lot of rubber, which didn't make it very commercial. But what happened with this chair is, is that it became... It was bought by um, Capellini that was a a luxury uh, furniture manufacturer in Italy. And it was really through Italy that I discovered the value of design to, um, to add desirability um, to, to an object. Because they always come out with something even better than you thought of first, first of all. Obviously, the, the, the British one is, is interesting because it's, um, it's more British, it's more rough, it's more me, actually. But the Italian one was more commercial and gave me a worldwide audience. And they'd taught me a lot about how you distribute stuff and you show stuff and, and really more than anything about quality. So the Italian experience was fantastic, but not always very good for uh, making money. Um, I'd gone from selling objects from my studio and a studio with maybe 17 boys working to actually um, just making 3% of the wholesale price, which wasn't optimum for me. Um, I tried going into industry, making plastic objects, and that worked for a while. And then I got my first job. So this was kind of significant for me because um, I'd leapt from being a self-taught, um, not even a craftsman, because my craft skills were 
were pitiful, really, but more um, uh, a self-producer to working for the biggest furniture group in the world, because Habitat was owned by IKEA at the time. So that was kind of great, and, um, and really became my university for, um, for how you do, for what really happens in, in, in the business. Because we look at a lot of magazines, and we assume things have been sold or, or bought by people. But when you're working for a company which got 70 or 100 stores in Europe and you get the, the sales figures every day, when you know what the cost of a container is from China to Europe, when you know where everything is made in lots and lots of different categories from textiles to toys to tableware, um, you learn a huge amount which informs your design, right? So um, I'll skip completely over the 10 years of Habitat that I spent there in corporate life because I didn't actually design it anything, I just told other people what to design, and moved swiftly on to me and my label. So I decided after corporate life that it was time to try a different model. And for a lot of people in product design, it's not so, so much the same in fashion design. It's most unusual to have your own brand, if you like. And um, the reason is the business is constructed really around manufacturing brands. So this is Vitra that you're probably familiar with, and Vitra does have a huge selection of amazing designers, and those designers are producing all kinds of different styles and different functionalities, all under the umbrella brand of, of Vitra. And their selection is multicolored, multi-shaped. Um, but for the designer, for the product designer itself, it's kind of terrifying, because you're up if you're trying to sell an object to Vitra against all of these amazing people, um, some of whom are still alive, and some who are completely dead, like the Eameses over there, um, that all have got their own voice, their own aesthetics, their own ideas, and that may launch at the same year as you and wipe you off the table, basically. So whether it's Ron Arad or, or Vitro or, or most of the, of, the, of the companies out there doing furniture and products in my sector are multi-designer uh, uh, multi -design brands all with a specific expertise. Vitra's is really office furniture. You know, Herman and Miller is a similar kind of setup, and it's even worse because there you're you're up against Magistretti, and you're up against uh, thousands of, of other designers that are all totally skilled and in complete competition. So I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do me. So I created my own label. And I'm very fortunate to have a brandable name, which is very easily pronounceable, even in Japan. And in Japan, they think I made it up because it's so tidy and it's got an X in the middle. Um, so we produce um, lighting we started off with, and lighting has been very good to us because lighting is a, a, a field which is in full evolution in terms of um, its um, uh, uh, progress from a technology point of view. Obviously, you all know about LEDs and, and the, the reduction in electricity consumption and how they run cold, but it's a great field to be in. It's also a place where people quite like to be modern, so particularly in, in chandeliers, it works for us um, as, as a place where people want to be seen to be innovative. It's an object which transforms your room just like a, a handbag transforms your outfit. So we've worked a lot in lighting, and you'll see... Um, our lights, you know, in various places, and it's been a great field to work in, but we also make furniture, and that's been great. And there you see some of the old objects coming back into the collection, and more lighting and furniture, and even office furniture, and then also accessories, you know, so it's been considerably more difficult than I thought at the beginning, because all of these businesses are normally in separate companies because they're all their own manufacturing um, challenge, they're all their own distribution challenge, and people consume them in different ways, and the materials and the scales that you work on uh, are, are always different, and the skills you need to design them are different. So doing a whole interior in the way that we're doing is actually quite difficult to replicate, and has been a bit of a nightmare, but it's given us a lot of adventures, particularly in accessories, to actually broaden out our appeal, because obviously, you know, people only buy a chandelier once in a lifetime or twice in a lifetime, but people are able to access these objects a bit more. We do tea, we do coffee, we do flowers, and we do vases, and we do all kinds of interesting accessories. More recently, I've gone a bit soft, where up to now I've been a bit metallic, probably. Went through a translucent period just a minute ago, and now I'm, I'm moving out of that into my soft and, and cosy face with textiles. 
Um, and we're, we're kind of atypical again in terms of interior design um, because there are very few, if not no, um, uh, product companies that have interior design arms. So we've got maybe we've got more designers working on interiors than we have on on products. It's sort of you know eight on interiors and maybe three on products, and that's that's it. Um, and the interiors form a great space to test out product, and it's a kind of feedback loop which has been very useful. So I've always been um, flummoxed as to why either product companies wouldn't wouldn't have an interior studio, or why conversely. Uh, interior companies wouldn't have a, a product studio. But they work very well in tandem because they allow us to, t to test out the luminosity, allow, allow us to test out um, or, or really find functions that aren't available to us. And we've done many bars and clubs and hotels. And it's taught us a lot of lessons, you know, um, about what's not available, like, for instance, things that you find in hotel bathrooms. Um, and the reason why you don't find good-looking things um, in hotel bathrooms in the main is because people nick them. So actually, <laughs> although I made the error of thinking that I should design lots of things which would suit a, a boutique hotel bathroom, they were pointless because nobody wants to specify them, just they just get instantly nicked. Um, but it, it made me move into um, the more intangible um, areas of interior design. And I think all too often I'm thinking or had been thinking more about the, the shape of things, the color of things, how you walk through a space, maybe the comfort of things. Um, but you often forget some of the more important kind of uh, assets or some of the more important um, things that, that, that are more intangible. So the smell is something really kind of interesting in, in, um, in an interior because all too often you walk out of a bar or a restaurant and what you remember is really the smell of the beer from the night before um, or a disgusting soap that they had in, it in, the, in the bathroom. So it's moved us towards doing um, weirdly perfumes, but also thinking about acoustics a lot. And, and you'll see you know, later on um, really then products about um, acoustics and about smell uh, as well as the more obvious uh, products that we do. I've even moved into washing up liquid, which is really the way that I'm now going to make my fortune because that's, that's the one area where nobody's really had a go. So that's my plan. And, and, um, and move on to a bit more inspiration on, on, um, on how the products are created, maybe. So this is a, a project which actually started in, in Africa, and it, this time in Lagos. And this was a, a little trip to, um, to Lagos and to Jaipur in India to try and work on a kind of not-for-profit basis um, to try and, and work with vanishing crafts in, 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 um, in the cities, right? So in, both in Lagos and in Jaipur, uh, they've traditionally had metal workers making things mainly on the street. And of course, the city councils are trying to move these people out because they're not very decorative in their view, although I think most of us would think the opposite. Um, and uh, the, the, the project in, in Lagos was a bit of a disaster. I dropped off maybe eight or ten students from the Royal College there, rushed off to Jaipur, dropped off another six students from um, the Royal College there, and left them to their own devices. Some of them came back with um, food poisoning, others came back and left the college altogether. But I, 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 I was kind of confronting them with the realities of of the potential of design. But um, I came back from that project so dissatisfied with the students' work because they'd made a lot of assumptions about what people could do and couldn't, and, and tried to work on at least the Indian project with something I thought was an easier way to do it. So, so in, in Jaipur, they have the tinkers that work with uh, bits of scrap metal, many nails making locks and stuff. And, and then they have also the people that make um, water, water vases and cooking pots. And, and these are the people I kind of concentrated on. Um, these people traditionally make water pots for, um, for the villages where people store water in, in copper and brass um, for medicinal purposes. And they, they go to the well and they, they carry these pots on their head. And these, these pots are now being replaced by cheaper equivalents, industrialized equivalents. So the people are losing their skills very rapidly. So I was, I was looking at this and thinking that, um, that, that, that really the problem wasn't so much design, was probably finding a, a new market for um, these beautiful or other those beautiful shapes, right? 
Um, and, you know, I came up with just changing the function and maybe adapting the shape a little bit. And these lamps have been a staple probably since the last time I came to Indaba um, 12 years ago. They've, they've been reasonably successful and, and they do, uh, they have kind of expanded in, into many forms and, and, um, and they, they give maybe 30 or 40 people, this time in Muradabad, which is a Muslim um, metalworking town in, in northeast India, um, permanent work and have been doing for the last 10 or 15 years. It's, it's no longer a not-for-profit project because I profit from it, um, but people um, get to have a job and making these things in reasonably um, reasonable conditions, right? Um, and, and you'll see that these lamps have become quite popular globally, and particularly on, on uh, internet websites, you'll see a lot of the lamps. I saw quite a lot in my hotel this morning. And of course, the lamps that I saw in my hotel and the ones that are on the website are not mine, are they? Um, so what you'll see is, is that the thing has become so endemic from, from the perspective of, of copying these shapes that even in India, if you go into a lighting shop, you won't get an Indian replica of the object. You'll get a Chinese replica of the object in India where even the Indians haven't bothered to copy it, uh, but they're buying cheaper fakes because the prices are so low. So it set me thinking a bit about what I could do about it, which is basically not a lot. It's kind of interesting that even the law lets you down in some territories. So in Australia, for instance, if, if somebody chooses to sell a fake Tom Dixon, they can call it a Tom Dixon as long as it's a rep, call, they call it Tom Dixon replica. And so the law militates against you being able to do anything because people are being honest about the, the fact that they're, um, that they're selling a fake, right? So that leaves you quite exposed. And... Um, so, I, you know, there's many ways of getting a, a cheap Tom Dixon, right? So um, I did notice when I was in India a, a big factory um, of IKEA, actually, again, that, um, that was making these bowls that had you know, quite a similar aspect to my lamps, right? And, of course, I can't do anything about that because um, IKEA bowl is a bowl and my lamp is a lamp, but it does look quite, quite similar to my lamp, doesn't it? And so... <laughs> At only 18 pounds, it could be quite a bargain. What's quite good now is the IKEA hacking websites, right? Where you can go online and, and people, um, people encourage you to make a fake Tom Dixon. I, I so love the Tom Dixon lights, but the price tag doesn't love me. And so this person has got a very cheap, but yet kind of stylish Tom Dixon lookalike. So that was fantastic. And I, I thought that was great. That was really reminding me of myself when I started finding bits of pots and pans and then turning them into objects. Um, and so I was quite um, inspired by this, inspired to the point, and there, there it is, a cheap Tom Dixon, $18, not bad. Um, that I thought I'd, I'd approach IKEA, because obviously I knew IKEA, and um, I know how they work, and I've always been fascinated by them and had a lot of respect for them, actually, because um, they, they have, for the last probably 50 years, been the leader in affordable design. So I did approach IKEA with a, with a project, thinking, well, if you can't beat them, then, then let's join them, shall we? IKEA from birth to death, <laughs> where I figured that most designers concentrate on the middle of life, you know, the, the, you know, the eating and you know, adults and children and the rest of it, but nobody deals with the little babies and nobody deals with the dead people either. So I was quite keen to, to, to try and, and bookend the, the, the whole of IKEA with this cot and this coffin. And I thought this was such an obvious, perfect idea for IKEA, but they said no. <laughs> and I, I'm, still, I'm still trying, but... Um, so that was my presentation to them, all done with a little IKEA man. You, do, you have IKEA here, don't you? No? Oh. So you don't actually know what I'm talking about at all. Anyway, <laughs> IKEA, IKEA are a big company that dominate in homewares and have huge sheds, right? And um, they're experts in bed. In fact, um, as on the last slide, a, a tenth of all Europeans are conceived on an IKEA bed. So I thought, well, I'm never going to do a bed in my own company, um, or a coffin for that matter. So maybe I'll, I'll approach, then we'll talk a bit about, about beds. And, and IKEA were, were not up for doing a bed or a coffin, they were up for doing a sofa. So we did end up compromising, mainly on the basis that beds and, and sofas often have the same construction. And it doesn't matter whether you're buying a really expensive bed or a really cheap bed, and they tend to have pretty poor quality timber frames with springs in them, and they're made in a very low-tech kind of way. So we talked a lot about the comfort of beds and the manufacturing 
um, ways of beds. And, and we came up with um, the idea of maybe trying to make it slightly more industrial in, in composition and making things out of um, uh, extruded aluminium. Because that would give us a, a much more solid platform. And this is the company in, in Sweden that produces um, uh, components for Volvo trucks. So very solid, very light, um, and very durable bed base. Again, trying to work against the perception that IKEA is, is quite disposable. So um, we, we plumped for aluminium and had the benefit of working with some amazing engineers. And that's what happens when you work with, with huge giants of, of, of industry. You get a lot more expertise. And, and this is the first iteration of at least the, the, the bed frame. And um, it's kind of interesting that it doesn't actually look a, a lot like one of my objects at all, I guess, but it's quite Swedish, right? So this is good because I'm, I'm working as a designer for, for um, IKEA in this, in this thing. And you'll notice that actually it's not that dissimilar from an iPhone. And, and um, probably not this one, which is iPhone 6, but iPhone 5, which had a flat band around it. And, and that's because it's the most economical way of enclosing um, a space, and, or, or rectangular space, and making it safe on the edges so people don't catch themselves on it. So I see the analogy of, of the iPhone not so much in the shape, but more in what we were starting to think about what people could do with their bed. And, um, so the idea came up, just like in the car industry, that what you'd do is you'd have your platform, which looked a bit like this, and that platform could mutate from a bed into a sofa, into lots of other things as your life evolved. Because what you, you get from IKEA is a huge amount of information about how people's lives are changing, how you're moving house more and more often, how people are living in more constrained spaces, they're moving into the city, they're breaking up more often, so your, your life is much more fluid than it ever was before. And the idea of buying a new IKEA bed and throwing it away every time you move didn't seem to make any sense. So we came, we came up with this idea of trying to um, add things to your bed. So if you started off with a student bed and then you might um, end up and your student might leave home and you might want to have it as a couch, um, you could do that. And you could add bits on. So the extrusion has a series of grooves underneath and, and inside that allow you to kind of mutate the object as your life evolves. And of course, because the frame is, is quite tough aluminium, um, you don't need to worry about, about it deteriorating. And you can see the plug-in lamp there. And, and effectively, it's, it's, it's gone into quite a large system of possibilities, which um, allow you to just add more pieces as you change um, what you do. So let's flick through a series of IKEA's publicity. And then, so that was kind of interesting in terms of trying to work out whether an object could, could leave um, my, my hands or my, my, my head uh, as an unfinished object. Because I think all too often you're, you're trying as much as possible to, to finish off an object and make it perfect bec before you let it out to the whole world. And um, that wasn't what I wanted to do at all. Here we were trying to say, well, just like with your iPhone, you start off with something, and if you want to add something, you can buy another piece of it, another app, let's say. And then we, we did a more interesting thing, which was to actually liberate the thing to a whole community of other people, including the IKEA hackers. So up to now, IKEA had been trying to constrain the hackers and stop them doing their activity, and they'd even tried to close the site down because it was using the IKEA logo. But in this project, we actively encouraged them and got them to work with us to add things on. But we also went around to maybe three colleges, um, Royal College in London, Parsons in New York, and one in Japan that I can't pronounce the name of, that, and, and got 25 students in each to work on the thing. And these were students from um, the landscaping course and from the digital design course and from the theater course and from the textiles course, not necessarily product designers, and got them to work a bit on, on this platform to see if we couldn't make a piece of furniture which was better than the one that I'd thought of. Um, because I figured that by having 75 nimble, bright, young minds, I'd definitely get a better object out of it than I could think of myself. And it kind of worked out a bit that way, because the, the, the kids were, were thinking uh, way beyond uh, what I thought of. And it's kind of interesting to see how scared also people are 
in, in, in the modern world and how a lot of the ideas that came out of that project were, were ideas about protection uh, and about disaster. And this is one specifically about the, um, the, the nature of, uh, of uh, shielding yourself from all of the electronic signals that um, are surrounding us the whole time, which some people find noxious. And then there were other people that had thought, well, maybe I can put an inflatable mattress in so that if it comes to it and there's a tsunami, I can float away on my bed. You know, so <laughs> there was a lot of that uh, and, and um, a lot of, of talk about students you know, having to use a bed um, as a couch during the day, then falling asleep on the bed and having to have somewhere to catch their laptop as they fell asleep. Um, and so there, there seemed to be a lot of, of kind of loneliness and... and um, and terror that the Japanese students also were doing, um, were raised the bed up so that you could hide underneath in an earthquake, for instance. So they were, everybody was trying to protect themselves from the, from the modern world in, in various ways. Um, but it was still a, a, a kind of a, an interesting um, opportunity. And this, this was my own hack. So again, I was trying to, to get beyond um, fighting IKEA, which I would never win. And in a kind of David and Goliath kind of way, I thought, no, not David and Goliath, let's rephrase that, more like a, a, a benign parasite, where I could actually use the logistics and the power, the distribution power of IKEA to actually sell my own wares. So this is an Icelandic sheepskin cover for this sofa, which completely covers the IKEA base. No longer does it look so Swedish. Um, it doesn't actually look British either. It looks a bit kind of maybe Viking or King Kong. But what it is is a phenomenally expensive um, cover which transforms this um, very affordable base into something which is much more uh, me, if you like. So, so my idea is really that I try and get IKEA to do the heavy lifting and then through my internet site sell plugins or, or, or pimp, my, pimp my bed's components which allow me to, to actually transform it into a more Dixon-esque um, object than it was in the first place. And, and that was a kind of interesting um, possibility, again, of, of trying to think that, that, that this, this object is really an unfinished object. I mean, the problem with doing that is that you end up with a lot of things um, that come through that you have no control over. So as a designer, that's quite uh, hard to countenance. And then I guess the final thing about using aluminium and, and the rest of it is obviously it's, um, it's, it's recyclable. I mean, there's a lot of talk about recyclability um, in everything that, that goes on in design at the moment, but the beauty of aluminium, although it's very, very heavy on power and on minerals to extract in the first place, um, it's recycled as a matter of course because it's a semi-precious metal in a way. And in the furniture industry, the majority of the aluminium is 75% recycled or the, 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 the aluminium we're using is 75% recycled just because it's the lowest grade of aluminium that you use in furniture. The good grade, the, the virgin grades of aluminium go into aerospace, into drinks cans and into automotive. So um, aluminium in, in furniture is endlessly recyclable and is recycled as a matter of course. Um, but I think the more interesting um, conversation in this is, is more about um, sustainability through longevity because I think ultimately if there's anything that makes me proud it's much more um, that I see the thing being used and reused and, and I'm now old enough to be able to see uh, my objects re-emerge in, in sales or even in car boot sales um, and for a second or third life and, and that's much more sustainable than recycling I'd say. You know I'm constantly trying to reinvent what the business looks like because the, the business in furniture and and, and products is kind of super old-fashioned compared to a lot of the things that we've been seeing um, earlier about technology and, and how, how transformational and disruptive technology can be. Most of the people in this business do this kind of extraordinary logistics chain where things are made in, in low-cost labor countries or, uh, and components are taken from all over the world and they're, they're manufactured in huge quantity and then they're sent around the world again. I mean, we sometimes make things in Poland and then sell them in China. We sometimes make things in China, assemble them with something made in Germany, take them to a warehouse in, in London and then send them back out to New York. And um, So you can talk about the sustainability of the object, but really you've got to think also about how things are made. 
um, and, and where they go. And, and I've thought a lot about how you could get less clumsy and faster to market with things. And I, I do envy the, um, the tech companies because obviously they're in a brand new field where everything can be disruptive. But I like the idea of giving your things away like Google do. You know, Google give away their core service um, for free. And I thought, maybe I can do this with furniture. So I did the test. I, I took a thousand chairs that I'd made in, in uh, polystyrene to Trafalgar Square. And I then gave them away. Um, which does actually make people go mad. Because people are so greedy um, that sometimes they grab two chairs, even though they were allowed only one. And sometimes this gentleman here is trying to work out how he can cycle home with his chair on his head. Um, so this was a kind of great, a great project and, and, and meant that I could manufacture a thousand chairs and then get rid of them in six minutes. So if, you know, anybody who's involved in, in chair design or chair selling knows that that's not bad, right? Um, so so you know, from an from a ease of, uh, ease of um, doing business as a designer and getting a chair into production, that was fantastic. But, but how did I do it? I did it through sponsorship. And again, I think in a way it might be easier for, for designers to these days get sponsorship for doing something rather than, um, rather than muck about trying to get an Italian company to notice you amongst all of the other designers in the world and put your thing into production in China bring it back to, to the UK, and then sell it in South Africa, or whatever you have to do to be a designer these days. So sponsorship is, is there and, and available to people, and that's how we paid for that, that project. Um, unfortunately, um, what happened next was very much that people started cashing in. I told you people were greedy, right? And, and this, this, after a thousand, a thousand chairs that were, could have sold at 200 pounds each, um, made me very upset indeed, because I could have had 200,000 pounds, as well as my sponsorship, right? So, um, so that, that was a non-sustainable model. So I tried something else. So, you know, obviously, there's a lot of talk right now about how the robots are going to come and they're going to take all of our jobs, and it's already starting to happen, right? And so th there was another little experiment that I did to try and, and, and get to the point where maybe I could try and do my business in a, in a very different way, which is really to try and use the robots before they can um, consume me, if you like. So I, I think there's a lot of talk and a lot of... Um, of uh, everybody talks about digital manufacturing. Mainly they're talking about rapid prototyping, which is kind of amazing if you need a, a, a hip replacement, um, but mainly makes a lot of plastic things that people um, don't really know what to do with that are quite expensive. Um, but I'm sure it will mature one day. But a, a technology that's already completely mature at the moment is, is metal bashing. So, so much like I used to make metal chairs before, uh, what's revolutionized manufacturing and digital manufacturing right now is, is the more traditional um, uh, skills that, that needed previously huge factories and many, many tools to, to do. So these, these machines, these robots exist that, that can turn their hands to many, many different tasks and, um, and they're making most of the consumer goods that you, um, that you buy, washing machines and cars and, and all the rest of it. So um, these robots are kind of quite versatile. And just like in the music industry, which has transformed from, um, from needing a huge studio um, with you know, a 48-track mixing desk and a record company to diffuse your thing. You can harness these machines from your laptop because the, the programs that we use now for designing uh, are, are the same programs that can be translated to actually speak to the, to the robots, right? So by thinking through what the robot can do easily, um, I can design something which can, in principle, be made anywhere. So in this scenario, I take my large, friendly robot to uh, Milan Furniture Fair where um, I instruct it uh, through my laptop to make a chair. And we make 200 chairs there and make a whole restaurant with chairs and lamps. Um, and here I'm looking quite smug with my chair, um, which has been made by my friendly robot. And in principle, there's no reason not to um, do this anywhere in South Africa. You just send files around, right? Um, so these are the chairs. And you can see that, just as I was talking about quite early on, 
in terms of the machine determining a bit the, the aesthetic of the product, um, the, 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 the robot here has defined a bit what the style of the chair is going to be. Looks a bit like a 2CV Citroën, or um, it looks a bit like a remover case maybe, but it's, it's defined by what the machine can do. And that machine can, can roll edges, it can, it can put strengthening lines, it can put a, a, a rivet hole or a screw hole in, into the object. So nothing's changed then from when I started to, to even now in terms of how I design. And here I look even happier because I'm, I'm now in New York with the same machine making a completely different object. Um, and that object again is, is um, is manipulable um, with, with your computer to make different scales or different patterns. Uh, so this is a, a, a two-meter size um, ball of the, same, of the same confection, the same manufacturing techniques made in New York City rather than made in, in, in London or South Africa, for that matter. So I think it's an important um, conversation in terms of... of of taking matters into your own hands. I mean, I, I, I have spoken to a few people that retail furniture here. I know that the furniture is twice as expensive in South Af Africa as it is in, in Europe through a variety of duties and transport costs and the rest of it. Um, and there's no reason why these objects couldn't actually be made and assembled in, in Africa from, um, from files sent in from Singapore or from, or from Saigon. Um, and, and I think that maybe we'll see evolve in, in the near future, a, a, a future which looks a bit like the medieval past, where in every high street you'll have a shop that can make um, a variety of different things for you um, to your measure or to your local needs. So um, there was maybe just one more project I was going to talk about. It's quite a risky business doing what I'm doing because I'm constantly gambling on, on the next big thing that I'm going to produce and the bigger we get, the more we put into stock, the more we, we manufacture. A lot of my experiments in new methods of production have kind of come nowhere because um, I can't get people, even in my own company, to understand what the future looks like. So this is a little pers personal project that I've been cooking up, which is my underwater, my underwater chair factory, right? So... Um, I did discover on the internet, you must try the internet because it's very useful to find things like this, um, a 1970s scientist or visionary called Wolf Hilberts who had invented a technique um, in his mind for making or building islands un un underwater and floating them up. So he'd worked out that he could, he could um, make a, 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 a slim steel framework made out of mesh or, or, or reinforcement rod, and electrify it with a very small voltage of electricity, and a natural concrete would, would form on this framework. And um, so I gaily went about actually setting up a factory uh, in the Bahamas. And um, so I made a series of frameworks and decided to grow my furniture uh, underwater. So here we have my frameworks ready to get sunk. And, um, and so I sunk them. And, and then with a, with a solar panel, you can, you can provide the, the three watts uh, per square meter of electricity you need, very low energy consumption, uh, maybe six volts. And what happens is, as a consequence of electrifying these things is the minerals in the seawater start accreting around the, the, um, the reinforcement bars. And you can see here, maybe two years later, um, the... the um, accretion, the, the, the natural concrete which is formed, and, and these metal rods that were in the previous picture were maybe 8 millimetres or 6 millimetres thick, have now become 25 millimetres. And you can see also that what happens naturally is quite a lot of um, sea life starts um, accumulating on it, because it's actually um, a, able to encourage the growth of coral that you can graft onto the, onto the, the structure, and of sponges, and and as, as a result, this is me actually pulling out my, my first experiment after two years to see how it's going. Luckily, it's in the Bahamas, quite a nice place to have a factory. And, um, and here it's, it's um, bleached in, in, the, in the sun, showing this kind of reinforced concrete that, that I've managed to grow on the surface. So you can see now, so I put them back in, and, and after four years this is the kind of growth that you start getting. So you can see that the six millimeter rod has suddenly become a massive chunk of, of concrete um, through the, this, uh, 
this process which, which uh, Wolf Hilberts called bio-rock, um, which is a way of, of really building structures underwater. And, you know, if you leave it long enough, it suddenly becomes really quite a massive chunk of, of limestone because that's effectively what it is. It's taking the, the, the calcium carbonate from the water and making it into, into rock. And so this is probably maybe six years of accretion around three reinforcement bars. So the, 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 the people that, that um, have patented this pro, pro, uh, process are called the Coral Reef Alliance, and they've done a series of different... Um, uh, tests, mainly sort of art tests, and, and um, in, in many in Indonesia, and, and this is the result after several years of growth, where these are, are corals that have been knocked off by, by, um, by yachts or, or by divers, um, and they pick up the small pieces of coral and they can, they can tie them onto the structures, and the coral itself will grow five times faster than it would in, in, in its natural state because of the electro, electrostatic process. So I'm, I'm trying to currently find a, a site for my next project. It may be in Africa, if I can have a good conversation later. And the idea there would be to, to actually build a much bigger um, facility, which becomes um, a bit more um, a means of generating electricity, a, me a means of, of um, growing seafood, be that seaweed or, 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 um, or she shells, um, encouraging fish to come and, 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 and live there. And also, more importantly, um, stop beach erosion, which seems to be an increasing problem right now in terms of, of uh, the, the, the sea levels going up. We're seeing a lot of beach erosion happening in all kinds of spaces. And these structures become actually quite good at stopping, um, stopping the waves because most beach defences tend to be big concrete blocks or, or huge stones that people drop into the water. And these have an effect of, of just um, bouncing back the waves, whereas these more transparent um, structures kind of mimic a bit more what, um, what a natural coral reef might do, which is to slow down the waves as they hit the beach. So in, in my master plan, in my fantasy, if you like, um, you'll see uh, a series of different um, structures that have different... Um, potential different um, uses, some of them to protect fish, while they breed, other ones making small chairs which might be sold on the international art market, um, others that are growing shell, shellfish or, or seaweed, and all of them contributing to a kind of underwater um, ecosystem that allows um, not only the, the beach to stay um, stable, but allows for ecotourism, let's say, and diving, and it's a beautiful future for me if my company fails, right? So there you go. So I'm here in Cape Town not just to um, talk to you because I think it's terrible to, um, to, to traverse the world just to speak for an hour on, on, on the stage. So this year I'm not going to Milan, which is uh, for our business the annual trip um, to sell your wares and to launch your new products. And I've decided instead to take my business, and this is me as a businessman here, um, to start in Africa and to launch things. So I sneaked out and, and I launched a, a new lamp in, in, uh, in Kramer last night, um, just before we went back to, to Indaba for a delicious dinner. And I'm proud to say that I've launched my, my, my next collection, at least one of them, here in, in South Africa. And that's a, a, a black lamp. Yeah. Because... If I think about it, the modern brand is not so much about, you know, your brand center or, or where you come from or the rest of it. You know, a modern brand is really about its network. And, and in the modern world, the network is everything, right? So what's kind of fabulous and what's kind of interesting about Cape Town is how it's become already a, a design hub and, and a part of this amazing network. And, and now that I've got 65 countries that sell my things, I think it's much more interesting to come to Cape Town, much warmer audience than I'd get actually in New York, <clears throat> um, and, um, and sort of develop the outer, outer parts of my network. So Cape Town is really number one on my Around the World in 90 Days uh, promotional tour, where I'll launch uh, projects in Casablanca and in Reykjavik and Auckland and in Vancouver rather than do the obvious Milan. So thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me.